So when you asked to describe your dad, when you're asked to describe him, what do you say? I don't get asked. <laughs> I don't get asked very often. I'll, I'll <laughs> to, ask you now. That, to describe, yeah. Uh, too many different words uh, come to mind. Uh, it was the relationship changed when when you, we worked with each other uh, for a while. Uh, so that sort of uh, puts a strain on things inevitably. Uh, and then, you know, later in later years, you get closer again. So, uh, but. You know, growing up, uh, we had an extremely happy childhood for the most part, and some of the, the you know the family memories, some that we all share as children. If you have a nice upbringing or whatever, you remember your childhood memories, and some of those will never leave. Uh, I, I couldn't describe him in one, two words, or whatever. Uh, you know, he was our dad, and you know most people love their dad, so uh, that never changes. No, he's been described as complex. Would that be fair? Yes. Uh, complex, contradictory at times. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how much of that was uh, complex yet very simple. I, I don't know. That's the contradiction, probably. Uh, you know, some very deep-rooted beliefs and in personal life and and work life as well. Uh, and and they remained sort of the principles by which you know we were brought up on and by which it, when you work for him, uh, they were the principles that you adhered to. Uh, yet sometimes there were odds with, uh, with certain things, so, uh, but you didn't question too often. You just got on and did it. You, I mean, you're right, you, you, you had the son's relationship, you had the player's relationship. Two very different relationships. Yeah, not really compatible uh, for that time when we were working together. and. I don't think we even tried. Uh, you know, once very early on, I think there was a youth team game that I was due to play in, and uh, I, on the Friday night, uh, I went round to my girlfriend's house. She was babysitting for a younger brother, and I got in, I don't know, half ten, eleven o'clock. And he said, Right, that's it, you're not playing tomorrow. And I said, Well, I've just been, you know, out for a couple of hours watching television, putting my feet up. I don't care. He said, You're not playing tomorrow. And uh, he said, I can't remember what else he said at the time, uh, but that was it. And then next morning, obviously, I didn't turn up, and I get a phone call from the youth team manager, where are you? <laughs> and he hadn't told the youth team manager that I wasn't coming. I said, well, I got told by the manager last night I wasn't playing. He said, well, he never told us. <laughs> uh, so there was that sort of incident occasionally, and uh, not too many falling outs. And I have to say, the players at the time, uh, they were the ones that really made the transition possible. Uh, and the senior players, uh, the Ian Bowyers, the Paul Hearts, the Gary Burtles, John Robertson, people like that were all around because uh, I'm sure they uh, were very sceptical and maybe even resented it, uh, a few of them. Uh, but as we got going and uh, we were playing a little bit uh, and we had a little bit of success, then obviously all those things eased. Mm. Did his relationship with you change then? <coughs> yeah, never. I Yes, uh, and also as a, a teenager, your relationship with your dad changes anyway. I think you know, uh, you know, you're, you're arguing with your parents half the time through your teens or whatever, rebelling, fighting against things, and that's no different. Uh, but then, when you're doing it in the workplace as well, not particularly arguing or rebelling, but you know, uh, then it puts a, an added pressure on it. So uh, it's yeah, it certainly changed, and it maybe took a good few years uh, afterwards. Uh, once we'd sort of after 93, uh, when he'd retired, it took probably a few good years and uh, the bond then that comes back into his grandchildren. Uh, that brings everybody back together again uh, and the immense pleasure uh, that he got from grandchildren. Simon had his uh, children first uh, and we had a couple and, uh, you know, I think that brings your family much closer together. What were his values as a father? Uh, discipline. Uh, not in a in a physical way, you know, he was brought up with discipline, a very large family, um, uh, so they all towed the line. Uh, and also respect for other people was the, the underlying uh, factor. It didn't matter uh, who they were or what they did. Uh, he had an immense respect for people. And, you know, when we, uh, <laughs> at Christmas, he'd have, uh, the dustman had come round or whatever, and he'd have them all on the porch having a drink or whatever, you know, looking after them and things like that. You know, the paper lad, the milkman or whatever. I had a note from the milkman last year. He said, uh, you might, don't remember me. He said, from Farrow's Way, where we used to live in Derby. He said, but I used to be your milkman. He said, and your dad was always very kind to me. Good luck for the playoffs at Burton. <laughs> and that's, you know, 30-odd years ago or whatever. Uh, but he was very, very kind to 
all sorts of people like that. Uh, that's where that's where he came from, and he also understood that it could have been him. He could have been uh, one of those fellows doing a job like that, uh, but he never ever uh, sort of would look down on anybody like that or anything. And he always had time for everybody, no matter what or who they were. Was there a particular example you remember of the way that he w he emphasised those values to you? Uh, one time we were coming through. Uh, on days where he could drive through the town centre in Derby and it was absolutely lashing down and a fella shouted or whatever, get out of that car, he said, let me get in it. He said, I, you know, I'll, he and this guy's walking down getting soaked or whatever and it, it upset him a bit, the fact that he was driving around and he probably had a Mercedes that he usually had or whatever uh, and it upset him a little bit, the fact that everybody couldn't have one. And I think he had a, a discussion with the director at Forest many years later where the, the guy was saying, well, you know, how can you be a Labour supporter and all this sort of thing and drive around in a Mercedes? And he said, well, the difference is, he said, you've got a Mercedes, he said, but you don't want anybody else to have one. He said, I want everybody to have a Mercedes. And I think that was summed up his uh, philosophy. So he was, in a way, very idealistic. Yeah, yeah. He knew that, <laughs> he knew that it wouldn't, uh, it, things like that wouldn't happen, uh, but it didn't stop him trying. He was very keen on, uh, on sharing things, whether it would be at work uh, or in his personal life with his family, friends or whatever. Uh, very, very generous. Mm. And what was, if you can explain this to us, um, what was his philosophy in terms of the way that football should be played? Uh, simple. Uh, so complex in a lot of ways that we went about it, uh, but very simple. Uh, you've got ten friends out there on the pitch, you've got ten teammates. Uh, look after them, look after the ball, give them the ball, give them the best possible ball that you can uh, and look after each other while you're out there. Uh, and everything, you know, all these... I can't remember one time in nine years or even watching training before that, we never did what you'd call a tactical session where we'd stop it and we'd set up or whatever, a back four or a team pattern or anything like that. There was never anything like that. You just played, you know, your six aside, your eight aside, however many there were. Uh, did a little bit of possession, a few games or whatever, uh, and everything came from that. And it was very simple. Uh, there wasn't any, well, if he does this or he does that, we never talked about the opposition or anything. Uh, we, we didn't worry about them. Uh, you just went out and played. And if, when broad parameters that you, you gave within those sort of things, you gave everything you got and you were honest, you're extremely loyal to you, extremely loyal. And, I think when you look at over the years, the number of players uh, that came back, to the, you know, especially to Forest, you know, uh, those that went uh, for what, different reasons, you know, John Robertson, Gary Bertles, Ian Bowyer, Steve Hodge, Neil Webb, uh, they all ended up coming back. And you know, I think I've heard people say, oh, once you turn him down, that's it; uh, he'll never have you back again. Well, there was none of that at all. None of that. Uh, you know, if you did okay for him, and, and you know, uh, then he would have you back didn't particularly want you to go in the first place uh, on many occasions, but he'd always take you back. Just in terms of uh, where, the, where the ball should be, up there or down there? Can you just tell well, us? Well, it was predominantly on the floor, uh, but occasionally, uh, you know, if you were playing uh, in certain, any positions really, if the ball had to go over the stand, it had to go over the stand. And, uh, remember uh, one game, I think we were losing at home 3-1 or whatever in the last minute, and we'd had a corner and the ball was cleared uh, and I missed kick one into the tenth throw as usual or something like that and the uh, crowd were booing and everything and he said nothing wrong with that, he said we'll lose 4-1, he said if you don't kick it in there. Uh, so but but it, the, gra the, the element of oh, put on the grass, Nigel? Of course, pass the ball to your teammate and give him the best possible pass that you can and, uh, and look after the ball, yeah, he wanted it on the, you know, you know, the people say, well, you play to feet, and you did, you played to your teammate, you played in space or whatever, but predominantly you wanted the ball on the floor uh, and to be played. Uh, because he understood as well, more than anything, uh, supporters have been at work all week, they've worked extremely hard to come and pay the 10, 15, 20 pound, whatever they paid, uh, to come and watch the team play football. And he wanted to give them the best possible entertainment he could, uh, the way that he believed that people wanted to watch football. What was that expression though about if God had, br if God had put... Yeah. Grass, you know, what, what was that expression? Ah, so some, was it if, if God had wanted the ball played in the air, he'd have put grass in the clouds or in the sky or something like that, yeah. Uh, so. And that was the principles you were told, you know. As I say, it wasn't, you didn't get down the training ground five days a week and sit there for two hours and say, right, you're going to play it on the floor. It was just encouraged and it was, you know, right from 16 when the lads were coming through and Forrest had a lot of good youngsters came, came through. 
we were just encouraged to play that way. And everybody knew we were playing that way. Uh, everybody knew the European Cup teams going back, everyone knew in the 80s, this is how Forest is going to play. There was no secret to it, uh, but stopping it was a different matter. He was years ahead of his time in many, many things. Uh, building stands was one. Uh, I mean, they built uh, the Lee stand at the baseball ground in, what, early 70s? Can't recall too many people building, uh, upgrading the grounds at that time. Did the same at Forest with the, once again, as soon as they had some success, he wanted to improve facilities for people. He wanted supporters to have better views and better facilities to watch the match. And in other ways, years ahead of his time? Preparation and things like that. Uh, he, he understood that teams didn't need running into the ground nine months of the year. And he understood that, you know, after Christmas was just an important part of the season as whatever. And he understood that players were tired at times. Uh, I think his overall view of how, how he treated players and everything uh, was, a, was a long way ahead. Uh, it didn't, you know, it wasn't as specific, well, you have to eat this, you have to do this, you have to do that. It was just a general encouragement of living uh, a life which was suitable uh, to your job. Yeah. Uh, and allied to your job. And it, so it wasn't a specific diet, but you knew if people were eating rubbish. Uh, I think famously John Robertson, when he first got to Forest, you know, uh, he used to say he lived out of a frying pan, you know, and uh, sort of changed that a little bit. John was never going to be the most athletic player, was he, in the world, but uh, he was a hell of a player. I think to recognise that uh, from what John was when he arrived as well, uh, you know, heading a lot of ways.